is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Fire and Hemlock by Diana Wynne Jones, brought to you by Patricia Bing Grant. In this section, now we are cooking with gas because Polly is starting to remember what she forgot and she's trying to retrace her steps and find somebody else who remembers too, which proves to be a lot harder than she thought it was going to be. Then she gets a surprise. I love you, Fiona. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha, and uh, thank you again to Patricia for commissioning this. Ah, I think there's only one episode's worth of pages left, so we are so close to the end. And I, at this point, like when I realized how close we are to the end, I was shocked because I have no idea what's happening still. Like, and again, usually that makes me angry. Like normally getting to this point, reading something and still feeling like I don't get it. I would just be like, all right, the fact that I still don't get it means you're not doing this right. But that's so not the case here, obviously. Like it's just not the case. Um, That's the whole point is that we're supposed to be as confused about everything as Polly is. We're supposed to be in the same headspace that she is, which successful. That has, that is what has happened. Um, And I just didn't expect after the part that we just read to jump ahead the four years and back into the present where she's trying to remember everything. And I was really gratified that we did that because I was getting to a point where I was like, all right, we, we're like, there's obviously something going on and now I need us to start playing detective and figure this out. And apparently, uh, Wynne Jones is of the same mind. So this jumping ahead is so disorienting because there's so many situations that are very similar to what we knew, but like not exactly. Um, and the one that upsets me the most is Seb, obviously, because she's engaged to him, which like the whole deal with Seb was that she just let him hang around because she didn't really know how to get rid of him or didn't have the heart to tell him to take a hike. And yet... Now they're engaged and they're, it's tempting to be like, they're only engaged out of like her apathy because she hasn't told him to get lost yet, but it feels like they have, she has to be under some kind of spell, compulsion, something to make her unequal to telling him to hit the road. I can't imagine that she's this passive the Polly that we know. And she may be simply because nobody has really told her different, but we find out in this section that like granny doesn't like him. Fiona doesn't like him. And I'm really wondering how everybody that she like loves and trusts in her life can be really like against somebody that she's about to marry and she's fine with it. That just doesn't feel like who she is to me. Um, But, you know, then there are people who are like that. Oh, man, I have a friend who is about to get married um, in a couple weeks, and I am going to be having an intervention with her and her maid of honor because her boyfriend is kind of an abusive fuck. And she's like one of my best friends. And I just I've tried to like hint that maybe this isn't a good idea because she's constantly in tears about him. And I finally decided it's time for like a sit down. It's time for a serious girl. We love you. And we're afraid for you kind of thing. And I imagine that it's not at that point with Seb and all of her family and friends. Like he's not abusing her. It's uh, except that he kind of is right. Like with the mental thing, it's almost like he's drugging her. Um, At least he's not abusing her in a way that they can see. I'll add that caveat. But it's definitely like one of those low level. I, this is how I'm interpreting it. What I think they're feeling is that they know something's off about him and wrong with him, but that they can't put their finger on what it is. And 
I feel like sometimes that can be worse because you want to say something to a person, but you don't have any specific evidence to like point to. It's just this like gut feeling, which is not helpful. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm just really curious about how, what exactly it is about him that they don't like, like, you know, <clears throat> beyond the fact that obviously she's not that into him. Is that it? Is that all it is? But we don't really find out and maybe we don't need to. I'm just curious personally. Um, so, oh, so I want to say hi. Patricia's in the chat and Abby just got here. Hi, Abby. Um, welcome to you both. So when we get started on this next section, we have, um, the immediate aftermath of uh, Ed bringing Leslie and Polly back to Granny's after the incident in the funhouse. And um, this is an interesting moment where Leslie says that he hates Mary Fields. He says, first female I've ever hated. And I can't figure this out, guys. What is Mary Fields' deal that everybody dislikes her? What is it? There's got it. There's something because uh, like I said, on the outside, everything that she says and does feels somewhat innocuous. And I posited in the last episode that maybe we're seeing her in a negative light purely because Polly doesn't like her. And Polly is slanting everything this woman says to make it somehow like suspicious or, you know, and I just don't, I don't know. I, I feel like um, Patricia's saying, well, didn't she just get into a screaming fit at Leslie for no reason? Was there, like, doesn't he, like, get on Tom's case for, like, ordering him around, though? And she's like, he's just been fucking injured? I don't feel like it was for no reason. Yeah, Abby's saying, but there kind of was a reason. Yeah, I feel like Leslie was being a bit of a, an insensitive dick. And she was like, uh, hello, you fucking asshole. So... I don't know. I just, maybe that's all it is. Maybe he just doesn't like being told off and now he hates her. But even as, even at that age, like getting into like one altercation with a person isn't enough to just be like, oh, I fucking hate them. But maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe that's who he is. Um, so Leslie tells Polly that he saw the suits of armor and that they were both after her specifically, which I didn't expect at all. I never thought somebody else was going to be able to like really see what was going on. I'm not sure that we ever investigate the garbage monster from when she is in Brighton. Is that where it is? Bristol? Um, I don't know if we ever hear that like the Dumas Quartet people see the garbage monster. I don't think so. I think they have to like explain what happened and they believe them but they don't see it for themselves. So this moment with uh, him telling her, like, not only did I see them, but I could tell that they were after you specifically is a really compelling moment to me. Like, it's just a lot of evidence that there's um, different layers to this than I expected, which we do find out later with Leslie being somehow involved with Laurel, which is the weirdest. Um, so Abby's saying, well, how well does... Leslie even know her, I wonder. Maybe he's just saying that to try and make Polly feel better. Maybe. If Tom came to the store often, maybe he was bringing Mary Fields true. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Maybe. Um, so, finally, Tom, uh, Leslie says, something's going on. I don't understand about Tom. He kept coming into our shop, Mum said, and she said, each time he came, my Uncle Tom hid out the back until he'd gone. Now, why would he do that? Don't get me wrong. I'm, I've nothing against Tom. I like him, even though he had no business warning me off Mrs. Leroy like he did just now. Really angry he was about that. Polly sighed. He used to be married to Laurel. Leslie, he does know. Ah, then in that case, he's bound to think she's bad news, isn't he? I thought there was something. Yeah, so evidently, Leslie does not take that advice. He goes on ahead, getting involved with a woman that everybody says, uh that we all believe is like probably what in her late thirties, I'm going to guess. And at this point he's got to be 15. Well, yeah. Cause she says later that she's 17, I think. Um, and this is just a couple years before, but 
I don't think it's four years from this moment, right? It's four years from her first meeting Tom. Is it? I guess not. It's got to be that they were like 13 here then. Um, yeah, I think... Um, okay, I'm sorry. I'm getting like lost in my head here trying to figure out times and dates and how everything worked out. Patricia's saying, I think everyone's 15 now. Okay. Um, so... Um, Granny comes down and finally Anne calls and tells them that he's going to be fine, that they're at Mary Field's place and that she's taking really good care of him, even though he has not stopped screaming, swearing a ton. Um, and there's a really amazing line. Well, that's that then said Leslie as he got up to go, which was just how Polly felt too. There was a sort of flatness and finality to everything. Her jet of misery burst through the flatness like a drowning flood. She floated in it like a corpse for nearly a week. She could not even talk to Fiona because Fiona was too ill to be disturbed. Um, and this is a great setup because Fiona, like she invited her to come with her and Fiona couldn't go. But then she's not able to meet up with Fiona right after to talk about what happened, which at the moment feels like a real bummer because she needs a friend. But then later on, you find out that they didn't think Fiona was like part of anything and worth like changing her memories. So the, it, it, this is actually an advantage that she doesn't realize at the time. Um, so fucking Seb comes over and she doesn't feel like, and he like throws himself on the couch and looks at her like, come here, baby. And finally she starts to be like, listen, I'm just really not interested right now. And he talks about Tom and says that he knows what happened. And she asks him, why does your father do this? I don't understand. Seb says, how should I know? Jealous, maybe? Um, I expect it must go back to something I was too young to know about. Well, can't you guess even? Seb turned to look at her in astonishment. You do want to know, don't you? I'm afraid I haven't a clue. If you really want to know, why don't you ask old Tom? I should think he knows all right. He won't say, Polly said resentfully. I told you he was obstinate, said Seb. But you must know how to get round that. There are ways of asking, aren't there? If you really want to know, you have to ask him the right way. Make it impossible for him not to answer somehow. What does that mean? Like, I really can't under, like, is he talking, like, drugging, magic, booze, tricking there's so many ways that that could be interpreted and it just makes Seb into such a sketchy character, especially in light of the fact that he goes on to become a lawyer. <laughs> Yikes. Um, she did ask Tom, Polly knew, about a month after that, a month of hesitating and guilt and misery such as she had never known. It was an awful time all round. Fiona was ill. The chicken pox had given her shingles. Yikes. And she was ill most of that summer. Um, Polly was thrown back on Nina's company, and she no longer enjoyed being with Nina very much. Granny caught a bad cold, and Ivy telephoned to say that Ken was acting very secretively, and she thought he was deceiving her. Oh, not again, Mom, Polly said angrily, out of her misery. Yes, again, said Ivy. It must be destiny or something. I didn't realize at first because Ken's so quiet, but do you know? I didn't mean that, Mom, Polly said. This is the third time. I know, said Ivy. I did think third time lucky, and I was bound to get a little happiness this time, but... Mom, Polly nearly shouted, have you thought maybe it isn't poor old Ken who's wrong? Have you thought it may be you? Ivy made an incredulous, angry noise and put the phone down. And it is you, Polly said into the whirring afterwards before she hung up, too. Bless you, Polly, for saying the thing. I know it does no good. I just needed somebody to just say it for Christ's sake. You know how that is. I know it's not going to do any good. She's not going to believe you. She's not going to hear you, whatever. But Jesus, somebody needs to say it. Um, so she's trying to like get advice from Nina. And the way she phrases this, there's something I ought not to do. But if I don't do it, I won't understand something enough to be any good to someone. Do you think I shouldn't do it? 
Wow, said Nina. She gave the rich chuckle she had cultivated to replace her giggle. If you mean anything like I think you mean, why not? Where's the harm? What's wrong with finding out things? Yeah, she thinks it's sex. She thinks that Polly's like, if I don't learn about sex, I'm not going to be any good. Do you think that I should? And Nina's just like, fucking yeah, I do. Of course I think you should. But yeah. She doesn't actually take her advice on this because she gets the feeling po that Nina's talking about something else, and she's right. So then we get to the Tales from Nowhere again, which I have to confess, when they give her this book at the picnic that they have, it completely slipped my mind that this is the book from the beginning that she is looking at and like remembers the stories being different. I didn't even put that together until she starts talking about it here. Um. Sam's stories were grotesque and far-fetched and pathetic about some sad, twisty monsters. Anne's were direct and spine-chilling, two ghost stories. One of them had been called Fire and Hemlock. Polly was sure of it now. Ed's two were both SF, which is science fiction. It's weird that it's just SF, though. The first was about Martians, and the other one was called Two-Timer, about the man who altered his past and ended up with double memories. Polly thought that was less good than any of the others. Now here comes an interesting thing. Tom's were both about the Oba Sipped. He seemed to have got obsessed with that, Polly thought. The first was a funny story which reminded Polly of the giant in the supermarket. The Oba Sipped in this was a thing like a coat hanger with the owner's name on it, which kept turning up in unlikely places and getting the owner into trouble, in spite of his attempts to get rid of it, until it eventually interrupted a royal occasion and the queen ordered it burned. In his second story, the Oba Sipped was much more sinister. It was an evil thing, but nobody knew what it was, and it was never seen. Polly could hear Tom's voice as she read it and kept thinking of his badly typed le letters. That story pushed her finally off her ledge. She made up her mind to take Seb's advice, and she did. But what on earth had she done? Is Polly the Oba Sipped? Like, this is just such a... The, uh, something with the owner's name which kept turning up in unlikely places and getting the owner into trouble in spite of his attempts to get rid of it until eventually it, it interrupted a royal occasion a funeral maybe and the queen ordered it burned hmm the second part with the obus being sinister I don't know like maybe it's just Maybe it's that this second time around with her like brain becoming unfuzzied, but they don't, they're not all aware that this is happening, that she's like a threat that they can't see. I don't know. I'm just spitballing here. So that's the end of part three. And then we go into part four, which um, I think last time it was Abby who was like, hey, how are you liking the little bits at the beginning of the chapters? Which I was like, oh, right. Those. And so this first chapter for part four is by Tam Lin. Had I the wit, yestreen, yestreen, that I have got today, I'd pay my tax seven times to hell ere you were one away, which feels relevant. Yestreen is not a word I am familiar with, I'll just say. Probably a thing. Don't know if it is. Feels real. Um, four years later, Polly sat on the edge of her bed and took a bewildered look at the book as it now seemed to be. Um, and she goes through and finally says, and finally sees Anne Abraham's name as an author. So like she at first thought, okay, this has nothing to do with them anymore, but it does. It's just like the stories aren't written by the people that she had thought they were. And then she starts to look all over for other evidence of her involvement with Tom, um, the photo in the oval, uh, the oval frame, the soldiers that she has in that, um, in the envelope, um, the photographs of her and granny, because that Seb took those before her second set of memories tells her she had ever met him. 
There ought to be a map of nowhere, lots of half-finished stories of Hero and Tan Cool, one fat-finished one, and letters, postcards, letters. There ought to be a badly typed letter about a giant in a supermarket. None of those things were there. So, like, they not only changed her memory up, but went in and took stuff, which I just can't imagine what the hell they're trying to hide here. Like, I just don't know. And whatever they've done didn't take for some reason. And I would like to know why that is. Like, why? Because it doesn't seem like this is an unfamiliar territory for these people, whoever they are and whatever they do. They definitely have done this sort of shit before. They've, like, obviously, they had to have. So has it gone wrong before? Have people started to remember before? Um, so she goes and uh, talks to Granny, who can tell something is wrong. And she asks if she, she knows Mr. Lin. And Granny doesn't respond to that. She doesn't have any moment of like, Mr. Lin, that rings a bell. No, nothing. But when she says, I met him gate crashing a funeral at Hunson House... Hunsden House. That house? Granny's head darted round at Polly. A strange look which in anyone else but Granny, Polly would have thought slightly mad, came into her sharp old face. What about that house? And I like that that house is capitalized. I don't know about that house. Hunsden House, Granny, Polly said. You do? Seb comes from there. So did Mr. Lynn. I don't know about it, Granny repeated, still with the same look. Is she going crazy? Polly wondered. What shall I do if she is? I've lived here for 30 years now, Granny said, and there's only one thing I do know, Polly. Every nine years at Halloween, a funeral comes down this road from that house. Old Mrs. Oaks told me that it's a woman every 81 years, and she comes down on Halloween. Every other time, it's a man, and he comes down the day after. What the fuck does that mean? What? Like, I am trying to put together any sort of theory on this, and I have nothing. There is no, like, every nine years, there, there's no extant mythology that I can zero in on in my mind that matches up with any of this. So this has to be something that either I'm just not familiar with or that Wynne Jones invented for this book. And... It's a woman every 81 years, and she comes down on Halloween. Every other time, it's a man, and he comes down the day after. Comes down. Is that... Comes down, like, is that meant to be that she's the one getting buried? Or what? Every other time, it's a man, and he comes down the day after. Who... Oh, no. Is Tom going to be the one getting buried next? Because there's definitely that moment where she calls him and he says he's not going to be available after Halloween. <gasps> oh, no. Because it's going to have been nine years by then, right? <gasps> you guys, what's happening? Something's going to happen. Uh, I don't know. Cold all through with her hair pricking at the back of her neck, yeah, you think? Polly knelt and stared at Granny. Mint Chalk, aware that something peculiar was delaying her supper, began squirming indignantly. I love the details about Mint Chalk. Um, and Granny tells her, if I were to tell you what they were in that house, you'd laugh and not believe me. Nowadays, they lay it on the men not to tell you no. Which, Polly doesn't push to ask what that means. And it kills me that she just lets that go. Uh, just ask, lady. No, I won't laugh. Just tell me. Um, so finally, she tells her, like, you need to push then. Um, you have to think and figure this out. And if you've got something buried in your head, then you'll have to fetch it out before I can help you, won't you? And Polly decides to go and talk to her mom. This goes well. Yikes. Um, fucking Ivy is a disaster. Um, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself because they run into Nina. She runs into Nina and Leslie on the way. Leslie does not remember her. 
He looks at her in a way as if it seems like he may find her familiar, but he doesn't know who she is. Nina does and does not like her um, and tells her, uh, you have not spoken one word to me since we were in junior school. So why the sudden interest? This was true, according to Polly's plain single memories, and Polly herself had believed it enough to almost walk straight past without speaking. Nina obviously resented it, and resented even more the way Leslie was grinning at Polly. Um, and when Polly says to Leslie, do you know the Leroys? Leslie's face suddenly looked as if a pink light was shining on it, and Polly thought it took quite a lot to make Leslie blush. Sort of, he admitted. But he was obviously too uncomfortable to go on talking and let Nina pull him on past Polly. Um, and she tries to push and ask if he knows Tom and he doesn't. And Nina tells her to F off, which I always find it so amusing when F off is spelled out E-F-F. -F. Like, I don't know. It's like uh, Uncle Vernon saying more effing owls. I don't know why, but it's being spelled out is so funny to me always. Um, but yeah, so obviously we know now that Leslie got really embarrassed because he's having an affair with Laurel and doesn't expect other people to just call him out on it, which he thinks she's doing. I think I, I believe that he in that moment thought she was making a pointed remark and that he didn't know, like she had no idea. Um, so she goes to see her mom. Her mom has gained weight, has stopped like putting on makeup or trying to take care of herself. The house is a disaster. She's got like, uh, and her these days bulging feet were shoved into man's slippers, which is weird. Her bulging feet, I guess, cause she's put weight on, but that feels like there's like other stuff happening. Um, so obviously her mom is descending into some sort of madness. Like, I don't know if she is schizophrenic, maybe, because her paranoia is at such a level at this point and her self care is, has just ceased entirely. I feel like her mom has got to have a, a sincere mental problem that she could be medicated for. This feels pretty serious at this point. And like previously I just hated her so much because it just seemed like she was a selfish, terrible person. And at this, like, it, may, and it may still be, there are certainly people who I feel like maybe you would just call it a personality disorder. Um, and that might be the story here, but it feels like things have gotten worse. I don't know if they have, if they had to mess with her mom's head or not, because her mother was such a disaster and so willing to believe the worst of people that they may not have ever had to say anything. It's not like she was paying attention either. Like when... Polly tells her anything. She's not hearing her. She doesn't listen. So if like their efforts to sort of like rearrange her memories would, what is there to rearrange? It's not like she fucking even listens or remembers. Um, so yeah, Ivy, um, she says, don't worry about me. It's only my nerves again. And, uh, when, she, when Polly says she's going to college, Ivy says, go and waste your time reading useless books, run through the taxpayer's money, see your stuck up boyfriend and never think about me. Never care that I'm sitting here, a bundle of nerves with the new lodger starting deceiving me already and not a soul to turn to in my trouble. I only asked for a little happiness. You have to go out and take it in this world, which Polly finally says, happiness isn't a thing. You can't go out and get it like a cup of tea. It's the way you feel about things. But things have to go right if you're to feel happy, Ivy retorted, which honestly, to a degree, I do agree with. There has to be a certain amount of things going okay. But oftentimes we are so attached to the one way that we think things should go that we see that one way as the right way. And it's not necessarily. And I know I'm very guilty of that. As somebody who likes planning, as somebody who likes having control over things, I can be really resistant to surprise to unexpected changes in plans. And I'm learning to roll with that a little bit more as I get older. And honestly, the more I roll with it, the more fun I tend to have. But it is still something I fight. 
um, I will still have moments when plans suddenly change of like this deep sadness and frustration that will almost bring me to tears at times. And I love that when she goes on to say, I only want what should be mine, Polly says, who says it should be yours? What law is it that says that? I do, said Ivy, because there's no law that I have to go out and collect it. But you've always been against me, she added. You never come here unless you're after something. I like this moment a lot. What law is it that says that? Because this is something that I struggle with with my mom. Um, I love my mom and she did grow up in a very bad situation. And so there's a lot of baggage that she has that's totally valid. And I really understand and respect that. But she does have this bizarre like entitlement, which I had for a long, a long time. Like I really have only just started to see it in myself in the last five years or so that everybody has nice things and I should too. Everybody gets to do X, Y, Z and I should too. And that's just not how it works. You don't get something just because you're alive. You don't have the right to something that other people have just because you exist. And I struggled with feeling that a lot because I heard her and internalized that. And it's just bullshit. Like, and, and there's also, I think, an element that is just also, do you even really want that? Or do you just think that's what reward you get, like in life? Is that actually even lining up with your like personal goals? Um, so yeah, like she just moved all the way across the country and left a bunch of stuff behind and was talking about how she needed a uh, TV stand. And I told her that they have some really nice looking and expensive ones at Ikea. And she argued with me about how she didn't want to buy junk anymore, that she deserved to have something nice, that she's never had anything really nice, which is a flat out lie. She's had plenty of nice things, but she has like run away from many situations and left those things behind and doesn't have them anymore. And it is a really frustrating thing to sit there and talk about how somebody deserves something that like they've had and just didn't seem to appreciate and then acting as if they've been robbed of it when they had every opportunity to like make things work and they just took the easier way out. And now they're resentful of the fact that they weren't able to take everything along with them. Um, and yeah. So this moment of just like, what law says that I really almost said that to her last time we talked and she was just like, I just want something really nice. I never had anything nice. And I, I feel like I just, I should be able to, and I'm like, why, why should you be able to? And also there's nothing wrong with Ikea guys. Ikea has got some great stuff. So, um, but anything, anyway, you know, you're a trouble mom. You're a miser, a happiness miser. And I'm not always after something. This is the first time I've ever asked you for anything. And even now it's only information. So this is when she says a different version of the thing that we had heard. Um, I'll never forget the time you made yourself believe poor David Bragg was sending you presents when it was your father all the time. Oh, okay, so that's what we're doing now. She thinks that the books Polly was getting were actually from her dad and that it was Polly who said that they were from David when really they were from Mr. Lynn and she was the one theorizing that they were from David because she thought he like was secretly trying to coddle her favor, curry her favor. That's the word I want. Um, coddled curry. So that's weird. Um, and she gets up and she starts to leave. She's thinking about whether or not Mr. Leroy is the one that made Ivy like this. It was a horrible thought because if so, it was indirectly Polly's fault, which Polly just really loves to blame herself for shit. She really does. Um, and finally, Ivy says... Um, look at you. You've rotted your mind with reading books. You can't take a realistic view of life like I do. You can't see the world as it is any longer. Thank you for that, Polly said, gasping a little. You make it hard for anyone to be sorry for you, Mum. Goodbye. 
This is interesting that Polly's gasping at this because I feel like this is by far one of the least hurtful things that her mother has ever said. But maybe it's just the fact that she says you can't see the world as it is any longer and that's what Polly's going through. Um, but there's like the way that it's written makes it feel like she just took that moment really personally. Maybe it's just a combo. So finally, she is running out of there and she heads over to um, the dude that she used to bring notes to from David, Mr. O'Keefe, who's still standing there by this pub. And she gets David Bragg's number from this guy. And he advises that she not call this dude, but she's like insistent because she needs to talk to somebody to see if they remember anything. And she gave the pen back and thanked him fervently. Hey, now, don't go doing that, smiling like that at the men, Mr. O'Keefe said. You've a soft heart. Someone will take advantage of if you go tempting us poor lads that way. Polly laughed, hoping that was the right way to respond. Oh, yo. As a young girl, do I remember instances like that with dudes making comments that I'm like, I'm pretty sure I, it, you can't be saying what I think you're saying, grandpa. So I'm going to pretend it's a joke. But I don't know if it is. And you'd like just try and make it a sort of like, ha <laughs> ha. And you grow up and realize that, no, they meant exactly what they said. They were not joking and they were disgusting and trash and men are trash. Um, uh, Patricia says, yeah, I had to stop talking to old men when I was young. I was not expecting them to be so rude. Yeah, they know that as a young girl, you don't know any better and you don't know exactly how to like defend yourself. So they come at you because they know you're not, you're, you're not going to shoot them down like an older woman who was done with their garbage is going to do. And that's always my assumption when dudes are dating women who are way younger than them is that they are bad people and older women won't put up with their shit. So they go after women who just don't know any better because they're young and not trying to say that young women are stupid. They just don't have the life experience yet. It's not their fault. There's no way to get that without aging. You just don't get that kind of life experience unless you're really unlucky, to be honest, early in life. So, yeah. Um, so she calls David and <sighs> it's real weird. She's 19 now. Damn. I didn't even realize she was so much older. Um, David, remember it well, always had a soft spot for you. Lovely, warm hearted kids. You were, how old are you now? 15, 16. And then finally come round and see me make an effort. Be sober tomorrow. Say you'll come. Um, and he can't remember that she mentioned any name, but he knows that he didn't send him and he knows her father didn't send him. Then Polly, I'm longing to see you again. I know I'm nothing but a lonely old soak these days, but you'd gladden my heart, Polly. Do come round. I'll come at Christmas, Polly promised, and rang off rather wishing she had not said that. He sounded as if he cherished a sentimental affection for her a little warmer than she had bargained for. Maybe all these compliments that used to annoy Ivy so had not been a game after all. And this was what Mr. O'Keefe had been warning her about. Yeah, Mr. O'Keefe's warning her about the same shit that Mr. O'Keefe just fucking did. How very generous of Mr. O'Keefe. But yeah, I think she's right. And I think that David Bragg is really on that line. Um, where yeah, I think that David's the kind of guy, and they're out there for God's sake, that is, attra is attracted to her. And if she gave him any encouragement, would absolutely pursue her. But knows it's wrong. And so tries to content himself with a fatherly attitude, even though that's really not what he wants. And that's just sort of a fill in for how like the kind of relationship he actually wants with her and that he never like imagines that anything would ever come of it. But if she acted like she was interested, he'd be all about it. And that's one of those like creepy things that it's impossible to like really know if it's true un unless it happens unless you push the issue and there's something so like unsettling to me about that sort of being like right below the surface and you're never really sure um yeah i don't know so david bragg 
uh, warning sign, big caution sign. Um, so she thinks about asking Seb, but then realizes what a fucking stupid idea that is because he, of course, is connected to the Leroy's. And if she acts like she's remembering anything, obviously it's going to get back to them. Um, and then she thinks about it had been when Seb had at last cajoled, bullied and pleaded with her to get engaged to him. And then he said she must meet his parents. Polly had gone up to London to their large and exquisitely furnished flat. She had been awed by the statues and pictures and antique furniture. A great contrast, she realized now, to the flat where she had gone to visit Mr. Lynn. And she wondered if Mr. Lynn could have lived in this magnificent flat at one time when he was married to Laurel. There had even been, she remembered now, a picture in the hall with a little light over it, an impressionist painting of a picnic party, which could have been the very one she had caused Mr. Lynn to steal nearly nine years before. So I'm wondering if that, like, because, you know, I was saying that the sad clown was related to her pantomime. Is this related to the picnic that they all had right before they went to the carnival? Um, And Seb's father says, well, now this is clever of you, Sebastian. He had said more than once. And then uh, Laurel had glared at Mr. Leroy when he said this. She had smiled and talked softly and charmingly to Polly, but Polly could tell Laurel was not pleased at all. And she asks Seb later, and is just like, so I don't think she likes me. And Seb says, yes, I knew she'd object, so I didn't tell her. And here comes a really weird couple of sentences. Um, I suppose you're her heir, aren't you? She must have had other plans for you. Seb gave a loud, hacking laugh, quite unlike his usual well-controlled churring. Plans, he said. Inherit from Laurel? I'll be lucky. I'm only half a Leroy anyway. My mother was as ordinary as you are. Oh. What? Hmm? Then he became serious and put his arm around Polly, which was a thing he very seldom did in the street. The fact is, Paul... I'm in a fairly tense situation with Laurel. Laurel and my father used to be married before, you see, before my father met my mother. (sighs) Okay. Weren't they married at the beginning of this book? Or they were about to get married when she was with Mr. Lynn. Then they were married when, like, for example, they went to see Mr. Lynn in concert. Is, did Seb spring fully formed from his mother's fucking skull? Like, how does this timing work out? Laurel and my father used to be married before my father met my mother. But they were, did they just get remarried? Again? I don't know. And Laurel doesn't get on with your mother, Polly guessed. This made Seb laugh again. He churred this time long and amused. My mother's dead. She died nearly nine years ago. That's the woman in the coffin. But how was Seb there? I'm so confused. At the funeral of his mother, whom he claims his mother was married to his dad before... I'm so the timing of this, you guys. I'm really, really like trying to make sense. Laurel and my father used to be married before my father met my mother, but they're married in this after his mother is dead. So either they got remarried or time is meaningless. (laughs) Um, uh, she died nearly nine years ago. That's got to be it, right? The one woman that it is every 81 years. Oh, guys, I am so confused. This is killing me. This is killing me. I just want to know so bad. Okay. Um, She could tell Seb was upset. He was almost grinding her against him, yet she could tell he was laughing at her, too. She was too confused to ask anymore. This was puzzling, Polly thought now. And it was even more puzzling how pleased Mr. Leroy had been to see her. She shuddered. 
If there was one thing she was sure of now, it was that Mr. Leroy had it in for her. So what was going on? She ran through her memories, across the jolt where she had done God alone knew what, and on into the plain single four years beyond. Back and forth, there was always that jolt, then such a difference, Mr. Leroy glad to see her, and said behaving as if he had never met her before that party of Fiona's. Um, and she remembers meeting Seb and like feeling like he's familiar and, uh, and it had surprised her later that something so much as it should be, should turn out to be so unexciting. Oh God, what a letdown, right? Um, so finally she, uh, she goes, she goes home and granny can tell that she's still trying to figure everything out. Um, she packs up everything to head off to college. And finally, she decides that she's going to write letters to um, Anne and Sam. And she can't remember their exact addresses, but she like does the best that she can. And then puts them in her bag to take to Oxford and mail from there, hoping that like the Leroy's don't see that she's attempting to reach out to people again which later on she kind of thinks you know what the Leroy's think that Seb's got me so I guess they're probably not paying attention anymore which I think is probably true um and Gran when she's leaving because Gran asks her what set you off and she says a book um Granny says take care and if a book set you off a book may help again when you fetched it out of you try it goodbye and don't forget to write so she goes and uh takes a gets a flat with um Fiona and it's this you know tiny little place they share a bathroom the bedrooms are part living rooms part dining rooms and she keeps on trying to think over everything and there's this weird moment um <laughs> and this is interesting because this is before Fiona mentions thinking that Tom is good looking she says um it seems so much the sanest explanation that she had simply made him up. But would you make up the smell of an old anorak or the feeling of a large hand squashing your face against it? Would you make up resistance against you in the muscles of an arm you were hugging? Polly squirmed at that. It was so much the way Nina had hugged Leslie's arm with Polly standing there like Mary Fields had done. Double purpose. You showed him you had a nice bosom and you showed the onlooker the arm was yours to hug. Small wonder Mary had made a catty remark. Is that what she thinks she was doing? That she was trying to show Tom she had a nice bosom? Really? But she was so young. Really? I mean, 15 isn't like, impo like, you know, I was definitely doing shit like that. But I didn't get the feeling she saw Tom in that way at all and that she would bother doing that. So I'm not sure if she's saying that that's what she was doing or if that's what Mary thought she was doing. Um, But... Mary saying you look like father and daughter doesn't seem like her interpreting it that way. So I feel like she's assigning some meaning there that wasn't necessarily there. Um, so anyway, um, she gets a letter from Seb about, you know, all of his, uh, training to be a barrister. I like the word barrister. Um, and she thinks about how she wants to, send him packing, but she doesn't do it. Um, Polly had not the heart to break with Seb, but she had not the heart to reply to his le letter either, which girl break up with this fucking weirdo. What are you doing? It's gotta be a spell. This just doesn't feel like her. Um, she thinks about, uh, going and seeing Mary, but she really can't do it. Like, which I don't blame her for. Like, <laughs> Based on how she fell, I wouldn't want to do that either. Um, so finally, she decides to call. And she asks about Lorenzo. And apparently Lorenzo is still alive, which I don't know how long horses live, but I was surprised by that. Um, I hear he's rather wild. Oh, no, he's quite a sedate old thing these days, Mary said, also lying. Polly was ready to bet. Who told you he wasn't? The previous owner, said Polly. Mr. Uh, what was the name? Sebastian Leroy, said Mary. Who, said Polly. Sebastian Leroy, Mary repeated, used to own Lorenzo. Oh, uh, 
Now, that's very odd. The person who told me about Lorenzo was called something else. What was it? Lynn. That's it. Thomas Lynn. I'm afraid I don't know who he can be, Mary said coldly. Do you want to buy the horse, or are you simply pumping me about my boyfriend's? I, said Polly, in that case, get off the line, said Mary. I'm expecting the vet to ring at any moment. And she puts down the receiver. So I don't know who that is, but also I assume you're talking about ex-boyfriends. Not well done, Mary. Just saying. Um, so finally, she like takes a walk to try and clear her head and just gets on a bus and goes to stow on the water where we have one of the most puzzling interactions yet. She goes in and Edna's sitting there and she decides to buy several things. Strikes up a conversation. Edna's obviously a little lonely and just chit chatting with her. Um, do you know Leslie Piper? My son used to go to school in Middleton and Polly's like, Oh, you're not his mom. Are you? And then they begin chatting. Um, and just as she's about to ask about, Thomas Lind, this fucking dude, comes out, um, and m m Mr. Piper is just, I can't imagine. It's like he's like his evil doppelganger. Um, but she's in the middle of explaining to Polly about, like, uh, Leslie, and she must be twice his age. She should know better, even if Leslie doesn't. And he's always there, always dancing about after her, and can't seem to think of anything else. I swear he didn't pick up his flute once all summer. And that's not right. He's at music college and he should be studying, even if he's learned to, if he's to earn a living from his playing, not chasing about after that rich Mrs. Leroy. So he comes in and he stares at her. What do you want? Spying, aren't you? Oh, now, Tom, we were just chatting. I heard her. She was pumping you. And what are you after? I'm only trying to trace a friend. Uh, do you know him by any chance? I do not get out of here. In a second, I haven't paid for what I bought yet. Do you know Mr. Lynn? But Edna was, of course, on Mr. Piper's side. I'm afraid not, dear, she said, and held out the orange plastic bag full of hardware to Polly. Then fear and failure seemed to break through a barrier in Polly. Because of Mr. Piper's uncivilized behavior, she asked something which it would never have occurred to her to ask otherwise. Was there a giant in the supermarket here? Funny you should say, Edna began. Mr. Piper interrupted with a noise of irritation. Oh, but it's got nothing to do. But you were ever so brave, you and Leslie, the year we first came here, that huge lunatic over on Robinson's throwing tins about. That, Mr. Piper said scornfully, has got nothing to do with anything. I said out, young woman. How long have you been here? she asked Edna. Nine years,' said Edna. "'Here's your bag, dear.' "'That's enough,' Mr. Piper barked. "'If you don't get out this instant, young woman, I shall call the police.' "'Why?' Polly asked bravely. "'I love her in this moment. that "'She's just like, oh, really? "'For pestering my wife. "'Sister, I mean. "'What is happening? "'What? "'My wife, sister. "'What?' What is this? Guys. So she leaves. I am almost at the end of this uh, chapter and or the end of this session. I'm at 55 minutes. I'm going to have to go over just a tiny bit. Um, but she's like thinking to herself still about Seb. And um, she was still certain that whatever was wrong was her fault, not Seb's. Girl, you need to stop. Holy shit, how can you not be feeling like this is Seb and his doing while making sure not to tell Seb anything because it's going to get back to the Leroy's? How can those two thoughts exist in your head? This doesn't make sense. So she comes in and Fiona's like, so great. I love Fiona. No nonsense with this bitch. Um, Polly, your tutor rang to know why you missed your tutorial today. What? Oh, my God. Polly leaped up, blinking. Fiona stood there severe in a blaze of red hair, staring accusingly. I thought my tutorial was tomorrow, Polly confessed. Good, said Fiona. You heard me for once. And it is tomorrow, and he didn't ring, but I had to get through somehow. What's the matter? You're not eating. You're not listening. You walk about half the night. I don't think you're doing a scrap of work. Are you in some kind of trouble over Marmaduke? 
Marmaduke was what Fiona always called Seb. She did not like him at all. Why is Marmaduke the name that she came up with for him? What does that mean? Is that something? I know there's the dog. Is she calling him a dog? Is that all it is? It's pretty clever, honestly. Um, finally, she tells her about how Thomas Lynn seems to have vanished out of everyone's mind. Um, and she says, oh, yeah, I, you used to talk about him. And I think I have seen him. Didn't he come to that panto when we were Pierrot and Pierrette? Polly stared at Fiona and clung to the sofa, unable to believe this sudden amazing stroke of luck. How could you have seen him? I was wanting to get to know you then, Fiona said. I was interested in everything you did. And on the second night of that panto, you suddenly went different as if you were inspired and the whole panto took off with you. And I wanted to know why. So when you went racing outside afterwards, I tiptoed nosily after you and kept out of sight by the cycle sheds. He was just getting into his car with a horsey looking girl. I was quite far away, of course, but there was enough light for me to see he was good looking. Good looking, said Polly. It would never have occurred to her to think of Thomas Lynn like that. I thought he was, Fiona said apologetically, and I was awed. But I think I was even more awed by the marveling sort of way he looked at you, as if you were some kind of miracle. The girl with him looked re really fed up, and I didn't wonder. As if you were some kind of miracle. This is just getting, guys, I'm really just... There are tiny threads that I can start to string together, and then something else happens that I can't, like, imagine that they're related in the end after all. Um, so she asks if, uh, Polly has written to him and she says that, you know, she's afraid that it's not going to come to anything. Um, and Fiona tells her to sit down and write the letter and then write her essay. And she's going to cook because Polly's real bad at cooking. And I just love how businesslike and matter of fact about all of this Fiona is, um, so she uh, finally decides that she's going to call instead of write. That writing, she thinks, is going to give herself away. Um, so she goes and looks up, first of all, uh, Fiona's idea is, why don't you like look in music shops and see if the quartet has got any albums out? And let's see. I'm not sure I've remembered it right. Pretending to think she leaned over with her elbows on the table and undid the catch of the silver chain. That's right, the opal. She decides that the opal is a thing that they might be using to, like, change her memory, which I don't... I don't know how I feel about this. Part of me tends to agree with her, and another part of me feels like this is her playing with fire. Um, but... Let's see. She... Uh, as she, she started to give Fiona the address, and as she did so, found her hand leaping to clutch the opal pendant round her neck. She stopped, realizing she had caught herself in the middle of something so habitual that she had never noticed till this moment. Is this how they did it? And so she takes it off, and she just throws it away. Um, which I just feel like, ugh, I just really don't know how I feel about it. I feel like it's probably the right thing to do. I really do, but like, I'm so concerned after that being given to her specifically for protection, that she might just be like, I don't know. Um, so she calls and Carla picks up and she's like, apparently his, uh, his machine is broken and Carla is taking his calls and she tells him, um, Mr. Lynn asked me to inform all business callers that he is sorry he will not be available after October the 31st. Oh, said Polly. Thank you. What? You guys. Is he going to die? Oh, I hate this so much. Okay. Um, so she goes to her class, then the record shop, and um, there's some kids collecting pennies for Guy Fawkes, which is mentioned so specifically both when she goes in and when she leaves. That I feel like that's going to mean something later. Um, and... She finds the Dumas Quartet and she and there's a picture of Mr. Lynn right there. So she knows that he is real and she goes and buys it, even though it's way more expensive than she can really afford and goes home and listens to it. Um, and she realizes as she looks at the picture that he is not nearly as old as she thought. She had kind of like imagined his hair is gray, but it's just really fair. 
um, and that his face isn't like as lined. Like there's all this readjusting of her memory, which is one of those things that happens when you get older, you start to realize that people that you thought were like twice your age were only like three years older than you. Um, but it's still kind of surprising, you know, um, when Polly first met him, she suspected he must have been so bleached and drained from the struggle to get divorced from Laurel that she had taken him for an old man as children do, but he was not, she thought turning the record the other way again. He simply had that kind of colorless fair hair, which she had taken for gray instead of which he was young with a career in the making until of course, Polly had stepped in and destroyed him. You clearly haven't destroyed him. He's got a career. He's got records. What are you talking about? Girl, stop doing this to yourself. Um, so when she goes back and listens, she like finds out that he's like his, the foremost cellist in England at this point, which I feel like has to be like part of a, pre like the fact that Leslie's really good at playing the flute, that he's also good at music and that Leslie is interested in him or that Laurel is interested in Leslie the way that she was interested in Tom feels like they've, it's gotta be something regarding music and that kind of talent. But I can't imagine what that even is. Um, halfway through Polly could hardly bear to listen to more. And she nearly took the record off. She knew what she had done now, but she kept it on and turned it over. Then back again to the first side several times while she reco recalled that time a month after the Middleton fair. And that's where I had to stop. And I was super mad about it. That was 49 pages. And I tried to justify to myself that I could keep reading, but I didn't because I was good. I want a cookie for it. So guys, even if Patricia doesn't commission the next episode immediately, I'm still going to like read this right away, right after I get off Crowdcast, because I have to know. I'm dying to know. Guys, this is such a weird book. What is this? Uh, this has been really fun. I've enjoyed this a lot. Um, <laughs> I just can't imagine. I'm like, I really don't have any idea. Usually, you know, I've got a pretty good imagination. I've got a lot of like uh, media consumption under my belt that I'm often able to like pull ideas from other things I've seen and like decide, okay, this and this. It's probably something like what I saw in this movie or I can't do that with this. This is like nothing I've ever read before. Um, yeah, God, I have no idea. All right. Well, do you all have any questions for me? Because um, I'm really over time at this point. Actually, I'm not that bad. I'm fine. But um, yeah, do you all have anything that you want to ask me before we wrap up? I feel like there's nothing probably that you can ask me that isn't going to be spoilery at this point. Um, so I'm expecting no, that you don't. But I figured that I would give you the chance. <laughs> Aren't I generous? Because um, yeah, I'm just like so eager to go and read this. I kind of wish that I had gotten the audiobook for this so that I could listen to it while I do some like house cleaning or something. Um, but I really just, this has really gripped me. I'm into it. Um, all right. Well, since nobody has said, I am going to, uh, take off and thank you again so much to Patricia for commissioning this book. It's so good. And I really can't wait to wrap this up. So thank you all so much for listening and to Lou motherfuckers. <laughs> Spoiled Network Podcast.